Good morning. We will start in one or two minutes. Okay, good morning. We will start in one minute. Good morning. This is the Dean is Up working group session two, Friday morning. Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Sorry. So this is the, the openings, the chairs. Uh, my name is Benno, Suzanne, my co-chair, Tim. It's online, remote. We'll do the, uh, the current updates, of, update of current work for the, for the working group in a minute. Warren is our area director sitting in front, um, and we use MeetEcho, Zulip, etc. Good. This is an ITF meeting. The working group meeting is an ITF meeting, so the note well applies. Uh, I assume everybody is aware of the note well, what it says. Good. This is, uh, as we don't have blue sheets anymore, Someone mentioned nobody knows. New generation don't know what the blue sheets are. Oh, excellent. They're the blue sheets. It's a <laughs> quad code. Excellent. Please sign in with the online tool. So you sign the blue sheets. Uh, for remote people, uh, of course, they are signed in and uh, sign also the blue sheets. So the, the meet echo at, uh, signing uh, attendance is the blue sheets. So make sure to sign in. Um, if you want walk over to the mic, use the online, oh, sorry, on-site tool to raise your hand and you get mic time. Or the, for the remote people, just raise hand and you will be queued. Um, that said, those are guide of, code of conduct guidelines. It's also part of the note well. 
we take this seriously. So bottom line is be respectful and friendly to each other. Good. So this is the agenda for today. Agenda bashing, current chairs, update. And Warren will give uh, need for, will, will give an update of some other documents and ISG work, five minutes. Then we go to the current working group of business and then for consideration and liaison. Um, we made a small change. Normally we go for working group business, but due to travel schedules, etc. And this was a draft that has seen some discussion on the mailing list. We put uh, delegation management via DDNS as first on the agenda and later the current working group business. I shared it also on the mailing list. Um, so Paul Hoffman will give two biz documents. Thank you, Paul. Um, there will be more updates on compact denial of existence and SVC Bain, Dane, sorry, Ben. Uh, and for consideration, a number of documents. They're all on the agenda, including uh, slides and uh, URLs to the data tracker documents. Good. Also, at the very end, we have two presentations, liaison with other working groups. Recex, another presentation by Scott. Scott Hollenbach and Martina Lenders will give uh, liaison with actually, I think, documents from two or one, Seabor of co Core and, well, another working group. Sorry, Martin, you can correct me later. Um, these are the document updates. Uh, we mentioned this last uh, idea. Oh, sorry, last working last meeting on Tuesday. Tuesday. And here we go. Tim, please go on. Oh, actually, I was thinking Warren should should speak now. If if okay. you can cut him in there, because I think this is the talk about fifty nine thirty three biz. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. So, a failure to communicate or draft ITS sub, DNS up, blah, blah, blah. Next slide. So, some history on this. This was the use of GOS 2012 signature algorithms in Blarg. The working group adopted it in. 2020, and then it had working group last call, and then it was sent to me, and then it went into IETF last call, and then it went to ISG email, and then it went on the telechat, and then there was a discuss from Roman, which was largely saying the IETF is steered away from doing crypto stuff in working groups. And he made a suggestion, which was, this should probably go to the ISE because that's where we do these sorts of discussions now. You know, the security group thinks that these discussions happen in the ISE and we're trying to not do them in the IETF quite as much and that's sort of the security ADs view. And so there was a whole bunch of discussion with the working group, right? Nope, somehow. Um, Warren managed to drop everybody off the thread where this was discussed. The sort of like, hey, here's the plan. You know, we're trying to see if this can go through the ISE. Is that okay? Anybody have any major heartburn? Apparently, somehow, I just managed to drop DNS off off the thread. And so we're trying to figure out how we fix this now. Um, we only discovered that the working group had been dropped off the thread when there was this conflict review, when the ISC was trying to move things through and was like, here's the plan. And I was like, oh yeah, yeah, this is all good. You know, it happened in the DNSOP working group. Um, nobody seems to mind if we send it through the ISC. And so um, what I am asking is, the ISC does not want to progress any documents which steps on a working group's toes, which I think is the obvious right thing to have happen. Um, what I am suggesting slash asking is, DN dear DNSOP working group, this was originally a DNSOP document. Um, 
it would be very hard to get it through the IESG at this point. We could have it become an IET, IETF document and try push real hard on the security ADs, or we can just say, dear ISE, can you please publish this? Um, my view is, you know, the ISE is moving it along. That seems fine to me. But, you know, this was clearly a failure to communicate. I should have asked the working group. I should not have accidentally dropped you off the thread. Does anybody have any major objections to us moving the document along? It goes through the ISE stream instead of the IETF stream. Hopefully some of this was like coherent and I didn't just ramble. It's Friday, I feel like I might have just yeah. rambled. So, Andre? Hi, um, this is Andre, ISC. Um, so I do have this request to review SM2 digital signature algorithm for the NSSEC. This is a similar situation. What should I do with that then? Um, we should probably discuss with the security ADs. The security AD thing, and there should be a wider discussion with the IETF. I believe the current view of the security area is that national crypto algorithms or actually all crypto algorithms should be discussed through CFRG. And if they're not being discussed through CFRG or their national crypto, probably the ISE is where the documents that discuss this should happen. But again, that's the ISEs. Thank, uh, sorry, not the ISEs. Yeah, yeah quick clarification. The draft that you're talking about is an independent submission. Yes. Oh, sweet. Problem solved. Okay. So I should just review it and be done with it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Peter? Hello, it's Peter from the ESEC. Uh, I just uh, want to say that I, I like how, how this is handled. And I mean, mistakes happen. It's very transparent. Thank you. Sweet. Thank you. Thank and you. also, thanks to the person who noticed like when this went through the conflict review. And I was like, I thought we had a hold it. Oh, crap. You all went on the thread. So. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Warren. Um, we also wrote a long email to the authors sort of explaining all this, and we forgot to, we dropped DNS op as well. Um, and so that was a, a combination of just whoops kind of thing. And we weren't trying to hide anything. We were just going through the whole process. So. Okay. Uh, Tim, shall I run the slides? You yes, I think, yeah. yeah, that will probably be better. So um, if you can, and then we did that Tuesday. So we, oh, so, and we wanted to double, just go back over DNSSEC validator requirements. I know we discussed this last meeting. Um, the chairs and Warren, we made a decision to park the document due to lack of consensus. Um, the authors have decided to submit the document to the independent stream, which is their right. And in that case, the working group will still need to be okay with this path. And I believe Elliot will contact the list or there'll be something that will go through. And, um, and I'm sorry, Elliot, I don't think it's happened, but I know we've sort of talked about this one. Um, and so we just have to make sure the working group's okay with this path. And that will come up at some point. Um, next slide. Um, we've got two documents in the editor queue, which is good. Um, things are moving along. Um, next slide. So in working group last call, the domain verification techniques, which of course was discussed Tuesday, um, it'll need a new working group last call with all the updates, but we're going to wait till they come back from the cab forum um, with some details. Now, the next one, the DNSSEC bootstrapping document, um, the working group last call is ongoing with little feedback. This may be my fault with how I wrote the email, but I know there's been several implementations of it. So that's good. People are doing stuff with it. And we're just trying to get some senses from the working group. Should we proceed with this thing? And I, I put a note in here. Do we use the fancy meet echo show of hands tool to get people to sort of speak up on this? Um, and I'd like to hear stuff from the, from the room or uh, we should hear something. Um, yeah, Tim, we're, um, 
I'm looking at time actually, and maybe oh, we're running out. We may, may, maybe um, give folks a chance to swap this document back in and comment okay. on the list. Okay. Just reminding people that for a working group last call, we do need positive support for publishing the document. So if you read it and it seems okay to you and you think it should advance, it's really helpful to us if you say that. It's yeah. not just right. um, reviewer mm -hmm. comments or criticisms we need. We need positive support. Yeah, and we know people have, uh, must like it because they're implementing it. So um, there is that going for it. So let's do the next slide. Um, another one that's in working group last call, 8109biz. Um, and that's kind of sitting, the first working group last call was botched and that was my bad. Um, but it's got no feedback on the second working group last call, but Paul Paul's gonna speak to this here shortly. Um, next slide. And the same thing for the working group adoption on this on this short update to the trust anchor RFC, um, it's it does it. There's not a lot of stuff going on, but you know, Paul again is going to is going to sort of speak to this here, very, like right after this. So next slide. Um, these two were kind of been kind of stuck, but um, Benno talked with um, the authors, and they're getting an additional author on DNSSEC automation, but. For NS val revalidation, we would like to sort of ask the working group if anybody's interested in helping Schumann on this. Please reach out, speak up or something because we do feel we need another author on this one to move this along. Um, next slide. So structured DNS error, um, work still going on. It's, you know, people seem to like it. QD count is one. Um, this was mentioned Tuesday, um, and we sort of feel it's pretty close to done. Um, and of course, generalized notify was adopted recently, and there's been some good discussion on the mailing list about that. And that's good. So next slide. What else is going on? Oh, yeah, two things on today's agenda, compact denial of existence and service B Dane. Um, and then CDS consistency, it's gotten some of the early reviews back and we believe it's ready for working group last call. Um, we're gonna sort of put that on, you know, on the pile with, with a few others. Um, so that's good. Uh, so next slide. Oh yeah, other documents. This happened yesterday in DNS SD. So QD counts now greater than one. Um, there is an, there's a use case for this in low capacity networks. And I know Ted and Stuart are both in Snack, and so they won't be here, but I'm sure Ray is around. Um, but basically the suggestion is to, is to basically resurrect um, his multi queue type document. And the question was posed in DNSSD, should the document exist in DNSSD or DNSOP? Um, and our opinion is we're very open as to which way it goes and we'll abide by whatever the working groups, you know, sort of what direction they, they give us is where we'll abide by. It. So um, there were some questions in Dean SSD about that yesterday. So next slide. And I think, yep, yep that's our stuff's in the data tracker, of course, GitHub. Um, and that's, I, I believe we covered all the documents. Um, and I know it's early, it's Friday morning. So everybody's sort of yeah. right. So um, reach out to us, make sure we've got everything. We didn't miss anything or we've, we're right place for um, status and stuff. And I believe next up, oh no, not Johan's first and then Paul. Yeah. I will let you go. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Are there any questions, comments after the chair's update? No? Okay. I would like to invite Johan for... Uh... There's the clicker. So my name is Johan Iren, sorry, my name is Johan Stenstam, and I work for the Swedish Registry and uh, 
do things with DNS. So there has been a fair amount of, of discussion on uh, the mailing list about this proposal that I'm about to present and also the generalized notifications draft, which is a working group document because they have clear overlap uh, in how to identify or rather how to announce services from the parent to the child. And I would like to sort of take a step back before I actually get into my real presentation, which is about the dynamic update stuff, and, and just break out the part of announcing services from the parent side. So if we look at this sort of from a slightly higher perspective, we have a delivery mechanism for some sort of service. That delivery mechanism could be through a notify, that's the generalized, generalized notification stuff, or it could be a DNS update possibly, according to the, the draft I'm presenting in, in a few minutes, or it could be something else. There are ways of delivering a service. And then we have the separate issue of how do we find where this service is being provided? How, do the, how does the parent announce the existence of and the location of this service? And those are actually two different things. So there has been discussions about whether we need a special record type to announce this stuff, whether, whether we could go with SOA M name or we could just send things to the authoritative name servers and we could do all sorts of different things. But those, those discussions are really mixing up the delivery of the service with how to locate where the service is. So if we take a step back here and we just think of something which isn't notifies, it isn't updates, it's, let's say, something out of band. Some sort of, of out of band provisioning thing. And here we use the example of uh, some, some sort of service where you can request through your registrar to the registry a change of the TTL for the records that constitute your delegation. So how would I announce this? Well, according to, to the different alternatives that we have in the, in the mixture of the update draft and the generalized notifications draft, well, we sort of think about this as, yes, we just add another scheme. We have two schemes, essentially. One is the notify scheme, two is the update scheme, and we add a third scheme, which is there is an API somewhere, and this is how to sort out the API details. The point of this is not in any way to say that this is an important service that the world absolutely needs. It may be. That's a separate discussion. The point of this is to abstract away that announcement of the existence of a service is separate from the delivery of the actual service. And let's not mix those two. Does that make sense? Okay, so given that, let's get into the update stuff. And unfortunately, because this is sort of stuff that happened on the mailing list yesterday, etc., the, the presentation I have, not to mention the draft I have, is sort of written from the point of view, we have this problem, we announce it the same way that we do the generalized notification, and these are the pros and cons, and this is the result. I, I honestly think that part of what we should do here may be that we should restructure both documents, sorry, and have possibly a separate document that only talks about how the parent announces services to the child. Nothing else. And then we have a separate document or documents that essentially define various services. But that's not how the documents are structured for the moment, so bear with me. So, the update stuff. Th this comes from sort of looking at the, the, the problem space of the generalized notifications and how to speed up the scanners and make them more efficient. Obviously, the notify that you send to the scanner, if we get that kind of service, will make the scanner more efficient. But then I thought, well, that's sort of roundabout. If the child primary already knows what the change is, and it could just not only notify the parent, 
or the registrar or whatever, it could actually provide the change itself in band. Hmm, that's a dynamic update. And it just has to sign the update for the parent or the registrar to be able to verify that it's authentic and it can be trusted. And that's where the problem statement comes from. We do have these synchronization issues between parents and children. We want that to go away. We want that to become completely automated. And just like the, the scanner does this for the signed child case, not everyone runs scanners. This proposal has a couple of other properties which make it interesting. So speaking of scanners, uh, there are parts of the world where there is a scanner that actually scans stuff and finds new CDS records being published and finds new CSYNC records being published and does the right thing afterwards. The Swedish registry is one of those places. So we, we actually do note automatically when children make changes. So we're sort of good with just generalized notifications to make the scanner slightly more efficient. But that's not true for the entire world. There are lots of places where there is no scanner, even though the children may be signed. And there are lots of places where there is no signed children. And there are even more places where some of the children are signed and some are not. So the generalized notifications will only help the part of the world where there is a scanner and all the children are signed. I would like to find some sort of solution for the rest of the world. So the rest of the world is actually rather large. We have 20 years of DNSX deployment, but actually we haven't managed to sign all of it. There are lots of unsigned children, a few unsigned parents also, not necessarily in the TLD space, but other kinds of parents, because there are other kinds of parents, a fair number of them. So. I primarily care about these other parts, the non-TLD parent parts. Not saying they are not important, but they can be solved through other means like scanners and notifications. So let's see where we can go with this. Um, yes, I basically said that scanners require DNSSEC. And that's, I have no objection to that. I'm just stating it as a fact that yes, they do require DNSSEC to be able to validate the CDS or the CSYNC that they find, and not every child is signed. But they're also complicated. Scanners are a new service. We, we can discuss whether they are, are uh, a good design or not, and the generalized notifications at least make them efficient, but they are still complex. So they work, but they add complexity to the system. Could we do this without a scanner? And the answer is obviously yes, we could. Dynamic update is one such mechanism. Uh, there is such support already in software that has been deployed for 15 years. Here's, here's one example in using bind. You could define a so-called update policy that says a key with the name foo.parent, for instance, can only update the delegation for food or parents, so you cannot change your neighbor's delegation, etc. You're sort of locked into only being able to deal with your own delegation stuff. And that's fine. Uh, or uh, let's say it's at least okay. It's not inherently unsafe. You, you get some rope and you can obviously tie yourself up in a knot and fall on, on the floor, but at least you will only tie yourself up on a knot and no one else. That's always good. Yeah. I, I, I do get some pushback on this. <laughs> uh, not everyone thinks this is a good idea. Um, but I think we should still consider this a bit. And when you start considering this a bit, you realize that there's lots of prior art here. This is not the first time we see this. This is actually not a new thing at all. But for some reason, and Mark has done most of the work here, for some reason, it hasn't taken off. Why is that? I mean, that's really the key question. There's no point in revisiting the same thing over and over again unless you 
identify some sort of reason why it didn't catch traction the last time. I think I know why this hasn't caught on. The first reason why it hasn't caught on is because it's sort of hard to know where to send the DNS update across a zone cut, across an organizational boundary. We have oceans of DNS update inside organizations. It works fine. We use it for everything, but not so much across organizational boundaries because it's hard to find where to send it. And even if you knew where to send it, it's not necessarily the case that you could send it there because the primary of the parent is typically firewalled off and it may be hidden and it's by design not meant to be reachable by random people on the public internet like children. So we need to figure out how to know where to send it. The second assumption, and I really think this is the key difference between this draft that we have now and Mark's draft 10 years ago. The second assumption is that for a long time, we thought that a dynamic update has to go into the primary and if it's validated and the signature is accepted and et cetera, et cetera, it will go straight into the zone. So the parent would have to be a dynamically updated zone, which is clearly not acceptable in many cases. And even in some cases where it could perceivably be accepted, it doesn't have a slot for, well, let's call it additional policy checks and verifications and, and make sure this is really not the child shooting itself in the foot. If you want any time for discussion. Sorry, yeah, yeah. For discussion, yeah. 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 Sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. So, so a very good thing with the scanners is that the scanners taught us that we can have a separate thing that makes these policy checks, makes this, these uh, verifications that whatever change is being proposed, like a child announcing a CDS, and let's look at that CDS, whether this is actually something that is sane, that will not cut the child off or something. All those things can be done separately. So we do the same thing. We send the dynamic update not to the primary name server of the parent. We send it to some sort of receiver service. And the receiver service is essentially the scanner and all these policy checks and stuff without any actual scanner. It's just a verification part, just to check that everything is good before sending this onwards to somehow be added to the parent zone. So we obviously have various <coughs> alternatives for figuring out where to send it. I would like to sidestep this completely now and say, this is a separate issue. We spoke about this on Tuesday. It's been debated on the mailing list and there are proposals and I think it should be discussed separately from the update stuff. So I will just skip this. Um, this brings us to an interesting place because we do have essentially two types of parents. We have the parents that are essentially registries. In many cases, those registries have registrars and there is EPP and there are provisioning infrastructure in place of various kinds. And in many, many cases, those are signed. And then we have all the other parents. Those are the guys that I, I care about here. And for the other parents, an update-based design would work fine, both for the signed children and for the unsigned children, which happens to be the majority. And in the, in the upper leftmost corner, obviously, we already have a solution. Registries with unsigned children, well, that's an interesting problem space. I don't have a solution here now, but I think it's something that should be thought about. And I will skip this. And I will skip this. I will just say that the, the update receiver is not a complicated piece of software. So where are we? Well, we, we, we have a scheme for how to know where to send the update. We're just reusing the same, same 
system for announcing parent-side services that we use for the generalized notifications, Wh whatever we come up with as the final result. And then we've essentially solved the first primary problem of, of why the old suggestions in this space have failed. And then we send it to a service so that we can do any kind of, of verifications and safety checks and making sure that the child is not shooting itself in the foot. And then we essentially solve the second problem. So we, we end up in a better space than we are today. So the, the, the remaining thing here is really what to do about keys. How should the parent get the public key to verify the signature on the update? And that's obviously important. Uh, so let's ponder that. In the signed case, where the child is signed, this is rather easy. The child just publishes the key, uh, presumably in the apex of the child's zone, as a key record, and the parent can just look it up and validate it, and, and we're fine. You can do, look it up every time, or you can look it up and store it in your own key store or whatever. There are solutions to this. Um, in the unsigned case, it's slightly harder. And there's no point in beating around the bush here. There is no magic bullet. But on the other hand, it's a problem that we haven't solved for 30 years. But if you look at it from, from another point of view, somehow every single child in the universe manages to communicate some information to the parent to get the delegation. It may be a piece of paper. It may be a web form. It may be some stupid thing or, or a local API as some organization, some sort of mechanism. And obviously we could use the same mechanism to communicate this key. But it will not work for everyone. It will work for some. And that's what we're aiming for here. So just to summarize, I want to combine two things. One thing that we already have, which is dynamic updates with another thing which is already a working group document, which is generalized notifications and a mechanism for locating parent-side services into this proposal. There is essentially nothing new here. And if the working group would like to adopt it, I would be happy. Questions? Yeah, go ahead, Wes. Yep, I'll keep this short. Uh, Wes Hardiker, uh, USC, ISI, and the ICANN board. Definitely not speaking for the ICANN board. Um, I really like this. I, I, you know, it's a mechanism when CSYNC, and, and, which I'm an author of, and CDS were designed, we had no ability to, to do notifications for where is the registrar that you need to go pork. I think this solves that problem. I think you, know, you indicated at the end the other problem that you didn't put on your problem space, which is the key distribution and, and authorization and authentication for all of those become extremely difficult, and that's why you know, we ended up doing scanning instead of something else. You've solved the notification problem, but it won't help the unsigned people because there's still no way to, you know, distribute an, an auth token. If they could do that, they're probably going to sign instead. Essentially, I agree with you. However, uh, as the focus is on, let's call it smaller parents, a university with 100 departments or a healthcare system or whatever, they already have mechanisms for communication and they do it manually and it's error prone and it has problems. Uh, they can, if they so choose, just do that once with this key and be done and everything will be automatic in the future. So it doesn't solve the initial problem, but it could make the long-term uh, value worth it. Ed. Yeah, Ed Lewis, I can, and I have absolutely nothing to do with the board because I'm just an org member. Um, on your third slide, you had an example that involved TTL updates. Uh, you don't have to scroll back to it. Okay. I just want to say that in regex yesterday, that was the same example used to do an update to, to EPP. So in other words, this, this is actually a, a you know, provisioning problem. Yeah. The second thing I want to say was uh, about 21 years ago, I did a memorable tutorial on secure dynamic update. Um, it was a very, very memorable event. Um, but I did, and after that, I went to work for registries. Never in 20 years uh, did anyone suggest using dynamic update in actual production outside of our internal updates for the database. No one ever thought of that as a public facing service. And there, I won't go into reasons, we, you know, no time, but just to let you know, the experience said to me that operators did not want that to be an external uh, offered service. 
Okay. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Tail. Let me close the queue. Yeah, um, what I'm thinking is actually that uh, there's a great deal of complexity here, and also it seems the working group is really interested. So it might make a lot of sense to go ahead and do a dedicated interim on the complexities and issues and general level of interest, because um, that way we would have more time than we have today. Thank you, Johan. And uh, please continue the discussion on the mailing list or on the hallway. Next, uh, Paul Hoffman. Thanks, Roger. Thank you. Do you want to hear my forehead? Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, none of us is. You can use it. <laughs> oh, this is great because it's actually one slide. Okay. Uh, oh, here, well, just so, so we know what we're talking about, this is already uh, a working group document. It's 8109 BIS about um, how do you initialize a resolver with priming queries. So the working group last call started in September. Some people noticed that there were questions about it, so they closed the working group last call. Basically, the working group last call got started and someone said, hey, there's still open issues in this document. Why are we in working group last call? We closed it, or I'm sorry, the chairs closed it. The authors put out a new draft at the beginning of, September, of October. Working group last call started again about a month ago. We've heard crickets. Um, actually, we haven't heard crickets. <laughs> and it's still in working group last call. So this is a request that people actually read the document. Um, as Suzanne said earlier, if you like things in working group last call, you should say so as well. Certainly we're open to um, anything where people say we don't like parts of the document and such, but it is sort of an important document to the ecosystem of the DNS, namely because priming really is a hard thing. Um, we know that, there are, that some people have disagreements about what you should do for repriming. We tried to cover those in the draft. Or, I mean, we do cover those in the draft. We would really like uh, especially implementers um, of resolvers to take a look at this, but also anybody, because this is an update to something that is fairly fundamental. This is not an extension to the DNS. This is like the basis of how do you get going. So that's it for, for that. Um, any questions? Probably not, because I suspect people have not read the draft, which is why they didn't comment on it. So please do comment. Yeah, that's a r real simple message. Go ahead and yep. uh, take a look at it. Speak up. A new deck is being shared. Okay, different document completely. This is about the DNSSEC trust anchor. Um, here, let me just get into this. So um, this is what I'll cover here. It's still not many slides. I'll talk about the status of where it is now. I'll talk about why we are revising a document so soon after we did, and then what's next. Um, so there is already, again, a call for working group ado adoption of this document started, again, about a month ago. Um, one person indicated support. No one has opposed. But the call's never completed because one person saying they're interested does not mean the working group should do it. On the other hand, normally you don't adopt if people say don't adopt. So please read the document. Um, I, I consider it to be fairly important for these reasons. Um, right now, as we are talking about the trust anchors that are going to be used in the future, um, people look to the, you know, to the original RFC and um, there's a really huge gaping technical problem in the original RFC that wasn't noticed until later. Um, yes, we have the errata system. No, almost nobody uses it. So if for no other reason, I would say that the first bullet is, is a reason to do the update. Um, but in addition, as many of you know, the trust anchor um, file is XML. We actually added, we're saying that, they, that IANA can add things, namely a public key. Right now, it's just a hash of a public key. 
why not put the public key in? Um, there was a simple reference update. Um, the other thing with the XML, people have said, why are there not comments in the XML saying stuff? And the answer is, even though that's legal in XML, nothing in the original RFC said that they might appear. And we all know people who will parse XML, not using an XML parser, they'll write it in Python, they'll write it in Perl, they'll write it in Lisp, and they will freak out when they see a comment. So this explicitly says, look for comments. Um, the other reason why we want this as a, a working group document is that people have always had mixed views about whether IANA should publish um, a PKIX or a CSR file and when they should do it. Um, IANA is willing to do what the IETF wants. I, by the way, I'm not speaking for IANA, but I speak with IANA. They're willing to do what the IETF wants here. Um, therefore, this is, you know, it would be good for the working group to say, we like these files, we don't like these files, they're redundant, whatever. Um, uh, I haven't actually filled in in the document what happened in 2017, which turned into 2018. Um, but so, so these are our reasons to revise. Um, and why are we doing this now? Because we learned a lot in 27, 2018. Um, and we know that IANA is going to roll the KSK in a couple years. Now, again, this is rolling the RSA KSK. We're not talking about algorithm rollovers at all. Although this document will certainly... Um, deal with algorithm rollovers. Um, and just as a side note, IANA has published um, a plan for rolling the KSK algorithm. Its uh, public comments are open now. Um, as is typical for ICANN, when there's a public comment period, everyone waits till the last day and tries to, you know, like tries to be the last one in or whatever. Please don't do that. Please do review that. That will affect this because we know that the trust anchor file. Again, some people are, are manually scanning the trust anchor file. They're going to freak out when there are, are, are a comment in there saying, by the way, this is a new algorithm. So um, that's the last slide. How long do we have? Thank you. Um, let's have three, five minutes, three okay. to five minutes for sure. discussion. Yeah, Warren? Questions. This is possibly a really stupid question Good. and or a really stupid idea. Good. But as you point out, people parse XML by hand. Mm -hmm. Logicals XML parsers are awful. Might we want to consider having it published in something that's, say, you know, a less awful format than XML, like JSON or Yang or anything that's not XML? We might, and that would certainly be part of this. Um, I, I think they would not abandon XML, but there's no reason to not do it in parallel. But they would probably only do that if the working group asked. Uh, Peter. Peter Dizek. Um So slide two or three said that there will be public key field. And so far there's only the hash and then, okay, why not the public key? Yep. Um, okay, fine, but um, the hash also works. So, so what's the motivation? I mean, it's extra implementation complexity. Um, because the trust anchor file is published before um, the key actually is uh, um, used. This is a way of preloading the, the key into, uh, for example, a lot of software distributions would like to see it ahead of time. Seeing the hash doesn't tell them what the key is. Okay, so um, I think it's a good idea to ensure that the hash is always there, even when the public key is there. Yeah, so, so this would be an optional public key. The hash is already required. Okay, good. So take a look in the document, make sure the XML matches what you expect. Okay. okay. Um, Ed? Ed? Ed Lewis, I can again. Um, I just wanted to clarify on the last point you had. Uh, the, the IANA public comment is not about a plan to roll the KSK algorithm. This is a study to see what has to be done before we can have a plan, just to set expectations of. So right. if you have ideas on that, uh, get involved with that. Yep. I put a plug in for that too. Right. And Ed, Ed or I can point you to that. Yep. So. Um, I think that's it. So chairs will, you know, again, we would like to see this adopted. Chairs will figure out when, when yeah. the adoption sort of ends. Um, but great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Uh, I think the chairs already shared it also on the mailing list. We think the chairs, it's an important document. So please give it a review or, uh, well, share support for adopting the document. Thanks.
Up next is uh, Schumann. Mike has to come down. <laughs> there you go. I want to thank our speakers for being so uh, careful about audio because we had a little bit of challenge with that the other day. So, yes. Okay, uh, so I'm Shumon. I'm going to give an update on the compact denial of existence draft. And um, Christian is here somewhere. Do you want to raise your hand? Okay, good. I might call on you a few times. Um, all right, so we uh, pushed out the latest update to the draft uh, at the uh, cutoff in mid-October. That's version uh, one, and I'm going to just run you through the changes. Uh, the implementation status section. So we have added a note about Cloudflare's uh, kind of pre-standard deployment of the uh, NX name type using, uh, a, for now, a private RR type code. And um, another thing, this is not actually in the draft. This is mainly for uh, your knowledge. NS1 has also, you, if you're on the OARC DNS operations mailing list, you may have noticed that they posted uh, earlier this week, actually, that they are also switching to the NX name Sentinel type. And that will happen, I think, uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Jan Chelak, who announced it, he was here actually earlier this week. But I think he's left, right, Shane? But Shane is here. I'm going to raise your hand. So if you have any questions, ask that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so where, um, where landing is that the consensus is we are only going to specify the NX name pseudotype. And the ENT type, which is, has been out in the field um, as part of uh, NS1's deployment, that will be effectively retired and mentioned in the draft for historical reasons. As far as I'm aware, there is only one dissenting view in the working group. That was uh, Victor Duchovny, who uh, first uh, suggested that we uh, maintain the ENT type for backwards compatible backwards compatibility reasons. And I think that was a perfectly reasonable suggestion. But then later on, he went further and said, maybe we should only have the ENT type and not the uh, NX name type too. So uh, I think the authors disagree with that. Mainly, our main compelling reason is that having only the ENT type does not allow us to distinguish NX domain responses across different implementations of online signing, for example compact denial versus traditional white lies. Uh, so that's the reason. So unless uh, we have a barrage of people coming up to the bike arguing uh, for that case, we're going to forge ahead with uh, what I just said. OK, so the next topic was um, many people requested that we need to have an, a section in the draft that explicitly talked about what a DNS server does when it receives an explicit query for the NX name type. Uh, so normally, we wouldn't expect any software to do this because it's a meta type. But you know, attackers or other people could do it. So we need to know uh, what to do. So our initial attempt was to kind of treat it like a normal query type and give it kind of a harmless response. And we tried to do that, but I, I think we ran into a few problems. So it, there, there are basically two uh, cases to consider. One is when you get an NX name query for a name that actually exists, including an empty non-terminal, and nothing different needs to happen in that case. The only special case is if you receive an NX name query for a name that actually does not exist. So the draft says, in that case, to stick in this special sentinel NX name into the type bitmap of the NX record. But if you do that for the NX name query itself, you create a little bit of a paradox because the NSEC record in the response claimed that data of type NX name exists. Where's the data? It has an empty answer section. So we tested a couple of resolvers. Uh, one, one or two of them at least serve failed. So then what will happen is, is that a problem? You can say it's not a problem. I don't care if they serve fail, but some operators might because the resolver is again then going to spray a bunch of queries to other authoritative servers. And maybe you don't want to do that. So the quick solution. The immediate solution is just special case NX name and pull out this special type in that response. And that's what we've written in the draft. But now I'm reconsidering this week when I thought about it a little bit more. 
because that creates another problem, which is potential loss of the NX domain signal, which is the very thing we were trying to repair in the trap. So an attacker could cause you to temporarily lose that signal for that non-existent domain. So uh, at this point, I'm back to my original instinct when people ask this question, uh, which is that this is a meta type. We should treat it as a meta type and just don't respond to it normally, give it an error. So I know the resolver implementations like bind and unbound, uh, they will give an error. I think it's format error, R code one, if you, get, if, if you give it a query for a meta type and they won't transmit the query upstream. So that's where I am. I would uh, love to hear your opinions uh, on, on this topic, let's, but let's move on to the next one. Um, the, the, the last thing we wanted to do was to figure out if there is a way to safely restore the NX domain code point into the, uh, into the R code field. And it's relatively easy to do with uh, non-DNSSEC enabled queries. You can just stuff, give it a normal NX domain response. Although for the authoritative server, there is a question about whether it's really worth doing because most modern resolvers will always send do equals one query. Queries, it doesn't matter what the downstream querier uh, sent it because by spec, if you are a DNSSEC aware resolver, you have to send do equals one upstream because you have a population of clients behind it. Some of them may be validating, some of them may be DNSSEC where you just don't know. Uh, for iterative resolvers, they could also do something uh, special. They can examine the NX name signal. And then for do equals zero clients behind them, they could just change the no error back to an NX domain. And that would actually work. I think Cloudflare has discussed this idea. The idea is in the draft, but I don't think uh, anyone's implemented it, but uh, Christian can correct me if I'm wrong. The trickier uh, situation, of course, is what to do with DNSSEC enabled queries. And as I've discussed on the mailing list in the past, as far as I'm aware, the only way we could do this is by introducing special signaling. So that's what we propose in the draft. We uh, now define a new EDNS header flag called Compact Answers OK, or CO. And the idea is that if a resolver sends this flag upstream to a compact denial server, they can respond with the NX name enhanced no data uh, response, but set the R code to NX domain because the resolver promised that they understand this and they won't mess up the DNS set proof. Um, and then of course, EDNS is a hop by hop signal, so you're gonna have to do it uh, on the downstream connection. The resolver has to uh, examine the NX uh, name and differentially respond to clients depending on the presence of this header flag. So this is an excerpt from what is in the draft today. It, the thing in the red, that's CO, that's the new uh, EDNS header flag that we've uh, uh, suggested. We are aware, we've talked to a few resolver implementers who are interested in implementing this. So we're aware that there's probably gonna be pushback from others that don't want to or will not read this draft. So currently the text says it's optional but recommended. There's no specific normative language in there. And that's another thing I wanna have a discussion about. And uh, the last thing I will end with is, I asked this question last time too and I didn't really get any feedback, but it's a topic that has come up in discussions with other people about, uh, you know, are we recommending that this draft should be used? And uh, what I'm saying is it isn't really a recommendation. What, I'm, what we're trying to do is standardize an existing deployment practice and fix some defects in the draft. And what we could do is have an applicability statement that says for new, on signing, on, new implementations of online signing, what should they do? So we could say that if they don't have the specific requirements for uh, what motivated this draft, maybe they should not do it. Maybe they should just use white lies or traditional minimal NSEC. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. And with that, I will stop for comments and questions. Yeah, Lewis, still if I can. Um, I have a question earlier. You were talking about uh, explicit queries for NX, NX name. Yep. Um, NSEC3 record, you, the NSEC3 record is not allowed, is, I don't know what the right word is, is not allowed, just forbidden to query for NSEC3. And uh, right. have you, I, I don't know if that's a, a rule that people know of. Has that come up in the sky? I just, you know, this, I just thought I was sitting here. 
um, we, can, we can just say you're just not allowed to ask that question. Uh, sure, yeah, I mean, we could uh, define it that way. We could say that yeah. this is not allowed to be queried. Yeah. So I think we still have to deal with the problem of what happens if you receive this query. Though, well, right? for insect three, the answer was you just come back. With, I've got, it's, it's in the spec somewhere. We yeah. just, I, I've worked with it. Um, well, for the applicability, um, we've talked about this, that, yeah, it is, you're, you're documenting things that are actually happening out there, which is a good thing to do, because we want to explain to people why they see this thing on the wire, right? Um, but I think it's also, I mean, this is work I'm doing side that I don't have completed yet, but in operations, simplicity is the way you have to go with things. Complexity is a problem for things. And you can see in, in all of the things we're going here, this is a very comp, this is somewhat complex lot to, to describe. We should just keep that in mind as this goes forward. I mean, I'm not going to say this is a bad idea to get rid of the draft and all that stuff, but we have to recognize that it's getting very hard. And, and you, you see the players that are, that are deploying this are major operations. Mm -hmm. Uh, for other places, it may be harder to know how to do this correctly. So I just I think the applicability statement is, is really a good thing to have in there saying, yeah, you don't do this unless you really know how much work it is to do that. Okay, great. Thank you, Ed. Christian. Christian, I'm with Cloudflare. Um, just some notes on the operational status of this. Uh, currently deployed is support, adding NX name, as was mentioned. Uh, there is currently a change in the release pipeline to not return the NX name for the NX name query type itself. So I will probably discuss with you, Schumann, sure. whether to back that out. Um, we are not yet re uh, responding correctly if we decide to go with the EDNS flag uh, for then doing the NX domain upgrade. But that okay. could be fairly... Okay, thank you, Christian. So let me, before you leave, let me ask a follow-up question. Um, uh, so you're thinking of doing this thing that's described here, and then, so for uh, for meta types, does the cloud, cloud you, you guys run a resolver too, uh, do you treat those specially and like not transmit those upstream and return an error? Do you, do you know what you guys do? For most of them, we serve fail or do form error. Form error, okay, okay, that's good to know. I was hoping that was the case. So that's the thing we could settle on, the last line there. Uh, the only problem with that is uh, there is an issue in the intervening time before we get an official IANA allocation because we're using private R type codes, and there's no distinction in that space about what what's reserved for meta, meta type. So I think that's a bug in the IANA classification of the R type space that we should probably fix. But I don't want to fix it as part of this draft. I'm just throwing it out there to the working group as something that we probably need to consider. Yeah, uh, yep. yep. Next is Ben. Oh, sorry, Ben has a question. For oh, oh. You. sorry. <laughs> sorry. And he's also the next presenter. Yes, Ben. Hi. Uh, I should keep it quick since I'm uh, competing with my own time. The, so, with this whole draft, I've always been puzzled because um, I don't quite understand the motivation. Uh, it's, if I understand correctly, it seems like the uh, the minimally covering NSEC system, while it requires two or three NSEC or NSEC three records in the response, only one of those has any dependency on the name that's being queried. The other two are uh, are like wild cards or basically static things related to the zone. So if you have any level of caching in your, okay, you're doing online signing, but like any reasonable implementation of online signing has a cache, but uh, to like reuse recent signatures. And if you have any level of caching, then those signatures are going to just come right out of the cache because they're the same for any uh, any NX domain, any missing domain response. So uh, that means that in my view, this this draft does not save any CPU time in any in any reasonable implementation. Uh, so I guess my, you know, first of all, is it really worth it, all this like incredible complexity to save basically just, you know, response size, not since it doesn't actually save CPU time. And uh, secondly, can we, can we update the text a little bit to clarify that? And, you know, in terms of recommendations, be clear about what the, what the benefits are. Yeah. 
Thanks, Ben. So, I, so Christian, do you want to take that? Because you guys were the originator of this. I can definitely say that any installation of the size of Cloudflare will save significant CPU time because of this, because you cannot necessarily be certain that uh, the same method, uh, the same uh, service will actually be responding to the next query coming in for the same zone. So there is significant CPU savings to be, to be had from that. Um, so, so essentially it sounds like you're saying that the, that the signature caches aren't big enough to cover basically one or two responses for every domain. Because like you could just cache the wildcard signature on every zone that's, uh, and then you'd be done. But if you have millions of zones, then maybe that your cache can't be big enough. That is correct. So, so oh. Christian, I think there's okay. also the, um, and Ben, this is, there's also the packet size argument, right? So you are yes. reducing the size of the packet. I don't know how big of a concern that is, but that was one yeah, of the motivations. Yeah, I, I just, I just didn't uh, bring that up since Ben already mentioned the, the size. Yep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so, sorry, sharing, we closed the queue uh, for questions. So uh, thank you, Shuman and uh, follow-up discussions on the mailing list. I, I didn't have a question. I did have an additional answer, but I can also Very do brief. it later. Because, yeah, well, yeah. so we dynamically generate answers that aren't the same, so there's no caching. OK, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, yeah we're running a bit late. It's our fault, uh, five minutes. So I try to be keep the, the presentations in and the discussions in time. Next is um, Ben with SPC Bidain. There we go. Um, you want to run the slides? I will run sure. the slides. Yeah. You can request, then I can hand it over to you. I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. I saw you in the queue, but this is even. Yeah, there you go. OK, great. Hi, everybody. Uh, so this is a working group document um, called Using Service Bindings with Dane. Oops, uh, the DNS directorate uh, requested a change to the title. It's now called something like Using Dane with Service Bindings and Quick. Uh, so just as a reminder, Dane is the thing where you have TLSA records and they're signed with DNSSEC, and that's 76.7.1, and 7.2 is Dane with MX records, 7.3 is Dane with SRV records, because every time you have a different kind of indirection where, where you're going through extra hops in the DNS, you need some explanation of how that interacts with Dane. Uh, basically, what, where do I look for the TLSA records? And so this draft is just following up in that chain for the service bindings records. So, so here's your basic Dane situation. Uh, uh, although this, there's uh, something slightly strange about this example, but never mind. The, so you have your owner name for an address record, and then you have some prefixes that go onto it to, to get the TLSA record. And here's what this draft says and has said for, uh, I think, from, from dash zero zero, which is if you have a service bindings record, like an HTTPS record in this example, then the TLSA records go essentially on the final transport endpoints. They go uh, alongside the address records, or in formal terms, the TLSA base domain is the final service bindings target name. Uh, this is exactly the same as what 76.7.3 says for SRV. So we're just replicating the SRV pattern here. Uh, there are some changes in this revision. One of them is a, a recommendation uh, based on feedback from Victor Dukovny to not rely on Dane's pretty weird C name behavior, which maybe we should just get rid of entirely, but uh, it seems like a kind of invasive general Dane thing to do in this draft, which this draft is supposed to be pretty narrowly focused on just using Dane with service bindings. A bunch of other minor terminology tweaks. Uh, there's one big new thing in here, which is a discussion of unknown key share attacks. So I want to talk about that. Uh, so there's this individual draft from a while back uh, that describes unknown key share attacks uh, and basically argues that Dane is 
unsafe with HTTP and uh, and and like recommends, okay, this is just an individual draft, but it recommends a bunch of restrictions on the way that Dane is used. And if you, uh, if you took those to heart, uh, that would really impair the way I think about this draft being used. And so I went in and tried to think very carefully about that attack and basically concluded that uh, modern HTTP is actually not vulnerable to it. And so we are okay, uh, but there is a recommendation in this draft not to use ancient versions of HTTP with Dane. So uh, I think the technical content here is stable and we're ready for working group last call, but I wanna note one more thing, which is that these, the, uh, this, these slides uh, were made a week ago, which means they predate the, uh, the flurry of activity around the DELEG record. And I think a lot of people might look at this draft and think like, you know, does anybody really use Dane? Like, why are you even bothering to put all this work into specifying the way Dane interacts with service bindings? Um, you know, what's the use case here? And for me, although the draft is, is specified in a fully general way, the real motivating use case has been this kind of authoritative encrypted DNS, the, the A dot or authenticated A dot use case. Uh, and that is also very much tied up in the, you know, that's very much closely related to the DELEG discussion, which also adopts service bindings and also is trying to achieve the, the same end. So if you're interested in the DELEG conversation, if you're interested in authenticating A dot setup, I would encourage you to take a look at this draft and think about whether it's suitable for that use case. I believe it is, like we designed it basically to work for that use case. Thank you, Ben. Any questions in the queue? No, okay. So please read the document. Uh, the chairs also think it's ready for, almost ready for working group last call. So please give feedback to Ben's draft on the mailing list and we'll take, well, we'll uh, get in contact with you, Ben, to plan a working group last call somewhere after the ITF and then schedule it in, well, mostly Tim and uh, Suzanne and I will kind of plan a number of working group last calls. So they don't overlap, but we make some progress in the working group. Great. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is uh, Philip. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is <coughs> Philip Pomber. Uh, I work for NLNet Labs. Um, this is relatively small ID, but I think it's worth um, documenting. So that's why I'm here. Um, basic idea is that um, you serve um, DNS using some kind of uh, any cast network. Um, you would like to have a node somewhere far away in a remote corner. Um, and for whatever reasons, uh, you expect a little bit of traffic. Um, but for example, your zone can be very large. So then you have a lot of overhead keeping the zone up to date for a little bit of traffic. Or on your server, you have a huge number of zones. Some of them may be locally uh, relevant, but many of them are not. And you would have to serve all of those zones. Um, so the goal is, um, can we have some sort of specification that says, well, um, an Anycast node, which should act like a secondary, can actually be a proxy. Um, and then uh, you can solve those problems because basically you're having a cache and you don't have to have a local copy of the zone. Um, so you can do a few basic things like you will probably want to clear the DRD bit to avoid uh, forwarding loops. Um, biggest change probably compared to what you would normally do in a cache is that you want to serve the original TTL because you want it to look like a secondary and not have just weird TTLs. That would be very confusing. Um, if you do that, then you need to re define a different cache replacement strategy because 
you, you basically don't want for TTLs to expire. You want to have something that looks like a secondary, so it should probably do what secondaries do, and that is look at uh, timeouts in the SOA, look at uh, notifies. Um, there's also some other timeout mechanism. And then when you become aware of a new uh, SOA version, then you should basically drop the cache and then uh, get new data because in the current DNS, there's no way of really knowing what changed. So in theory, if you want to go really far, you can feel also maybe well, you probably don't want to do IXFR and stuff like that because that might be too expensive. Um, and then if, if you want to be more advanced, then you can say, well, dropping a cache may get a huge traffic spike. So then it's possible that you want to sort of preload new entries for, for your, your hot cache items uh, before you discard uh, the old part of the cache. Um, there's some other things you can do um, that, of course, you can do. Uh, aggressive negative caching. Um, I have no clue if there are any cast deployments that actually do something uh, with the uh, EDNS client subnet option. If they do, then of course that also creates um, quite a bit of complexity. Um, so that's basically it for me. I wrote down uh, some ideas in a, a draft, uh, put uh, the source on GitHub. Um, so if people are interested in that, then it's worth continuing working on it. Thank you. Uh, Ed? Hey, Ed Sorry. Lewis, I can. Um, so when I read this, this, this sounds like lazy evaluation of zone transfer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what, what you're doing. And the question I had was, you know, how, what, how do you predict what parts of the zone transfer you actually want to get? Are you just responding to what I'm being asked for, and then I'll just maintain keeping getting that. I want to keep that up to date, SOA wise. I mean, because once in the authoritative server, we, you refresh from the, the source based on the SOA timers. If you're not doing some other artist or whatever uh, sort of thing. Uh, so I, that's, that was the question I had. How do you? How does the this this remote authoritative server know what part of the zone it actually wants to keep? Does it predict that, or is it just reaction to what it's getting queries for? That that's. That's the thing I was wondering about the use case because I can I've seen it. We've had uh, past lives uh, servers on very thin T ones, big zone, and, but X for worked for, to keep them update. But if you lost it, it was you know I understand that that is a problem case, but I'm just curious how you want to predict what parts of the zone you kind of want to lazy eval in that zone transfer sense. Um, well, my current line of thinking is not do anything special. So the assumption is that connectivity is good enough that for the few queries you get, you just ask one of the full secondaries for the answer and then you serve it locally. Uh, of course, this can be extended that if people say, well, we have really sort of bad network connections and we want to prefetch stuff and stuff like that. But yeah, that's probably a, a separate issue than yeah, what I wanted to solve. Thank you. Um, Stefan. Yeah, I like this uh, idea. Uh, we all, uh, at IJDN, we also uh, thought about it. And uh, if possible, I would like to help you with this uh, draft. Uh, thank you for presenting. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Peter? Hey, Peter Dysek. Uh, I just want to observe that to me, that sounds like a resolver with certain restricted functionality, like um, no TTL discounting and uh, it essentially only talks to one upstream and doesn't do full resolution. So um, it might help phrasing it in these terms in the document or in implementation. Yeah, well, with, certainly in the context of, of when you say resolver, people immediately think of a recursive resolver and then it becomes very confusing. So, so this thing can only forward to whatever configured secondary of the server it, supplies the real answer. It doesn't do anything else. Uh, so, so technically, it's, it's a resolver, but I think from a terminology point of view, it might get confusing. Thank you. Uh, Johan? I thought I was in the queue somewhere. Um, yeah. So, so I, I like this, uh, and uh, I, I discussed this with, with NLA. In the net labs before, but to go to, to Ed's question here about what I ex what part of the XR to optimize for, my, my answer is that 
for, for, for many zones, especially large zones, um, you actually will never, ever, ever, ever use most of the zone at a particular place somewhere in the world. So it's not a question of optimizing the die so far so much as not ever, 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 ever moving those 90% of the zone over to that faraway place that will never ever use it. Um, and that, that's, the, that's the background for, for something like this to be useful. And I think it would be extremely useful as more and more of the world uses any cost all over the place with zones that actually don't get queries all over the place. Uh, Peter? Peter Spacek, I see. Uh, I'm aware of at least one TLD which is doing this today and it's just bind a series over configured with limited number of zones and proxy in front which just flips the RDB. So the idea is kind of sound in a sense that it is done today for weird reasons, but yeah, people want it. So maybe it's worth describing how to do it properly instead of you know everyone hacking it together in slightly wrong way. Okay, okay. Uh, Peter, final. Yeah, thank you, Peter Kochinik. So this this idea pops up over and over again and has interesting use cases on a happy path. Um, from the terminology side or from the abstract side, what you present is, is an authoritative which just has a very long line to the database. So I'm wondering why you would want to standardize on that. It's just a, a special case. Um, what I think would be helpful is to document the operational considerations. The trade-off between the benign traffic that is expected versus the transfer of the whole zone is of course obvious. The other one is how does this behave under DDoS or under an attack that tries to exhaust this and enumerate the zone, for example, um, which makes this approach much, much less um, attractive actually. And that's what I would like to see documented um, because that's the, the operational part. And it's DNS op after all, thanks. So basically you say you, there should be some text about how to respond to a denial of service attack or what to expect when a denial of service attack happens and you have something like this deployed. Well, the, the, the DDoS doesn't have to be a, a traffic exhaustion or volume exhaustion. It could just be somebody enumerating the zone incidentally or intentionally, um, which makes this whole setup a bit questionable. If you can preclude that, that's fine, but that's exactly the discussion that might be helpful in, in that case. And again, protocol-wise, this is an authoritative that has a long line to the database. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Libor, with presentation format. Right. Yeah, we are good. Hi, I'm Libor Peltan from CZNIC. I will not be talking about solving fundamental problems of the DNS, but yeah, uh, just a tiny missing piece that I believe is, uh, is need, deserves to be filled in, in standardization. So let me start with RFC 8427, which defines the JSON format of DNS records and DNS messages. Uh, I guess this, uh, this RFC does an excellent job of defining the, the JSON format, not only like for, for example, alternative format of zone files, but mostly as an output format for utilities like DIC, which can be then used by several scripts that easily pass the format <laughs> if it's JSON. So I like this RFC, but it's interesting that this RFC has never been adopted by this document has now been adopted by DNSOP, and it was actually promoted as an individual submission by Paul Hoffman. Thank you, Paul, for that. And therefore, it's an informational document, despite its clearly normative nature. I also find some tiny inaccuracy, but, which was attempted to be fixed by an errata, but uh, unfortunately not that clearly. But the biggest missing point I found is that the definition of the JSON format for EDNS to the record is 
not at all defined by this document. So when I was myself uh, implementing this for KDIC utility, I tried to inspire myself by DIC. So I tried what DIC does when, uh, when asked for JSON format, and I found surprisingly that there is no mention of the EDN server record at all, even if it's included in the packet. So I shared this surprising finding with the world, and there was Peter Špaček around, who encouraged anyone to just uh, yeah, take, the, take the effort and write the specification of the JSON format speci specifically for EDNS, and also the standardized textual format for EDNS option because CSD utilities like DIC or KDIC or whatever do display the contents of EDNS, but they do it like in an unstandard uh, weird way for example, DIC also mixes up uh, separating different fields by commas at one time and by semicolon at other time. So this also deserves some attention. So I decided to volunteer and take the effort to, to write some useful, usable specification of those formats, both for EDNS. And Peter Špaček also told me that it would be, uh, I agree that it would be desirable that this format is really human readable. It's mostly intended for human eyes, so it would be really great if, uh, that, for example, textual mnemonics are used instead of uh, sole numbers, and if the structure of the format follows the semantic, uh, uh, the semantics of the DNS option rather than, for example, their binary syntax. So I like wrote down the requirements that I could have and it uh, actually showed up there is uh, not much uh, like maneuvering space for my own creativity to define the format. Simply the requirements uh, requires that the format looks like it looks now. Uh, at first, for example, in the, in the presentation format for EDNS, I tried to inspire myself by, by a SVCB presentation format, but in the end it was, uh, it actually showed us better to to mimic the current textual output of DIC so that it's similar to, to what is used now. So I, I bring this specification to the NSOP and I did not get too much of uh, feedback, but the feedback I got was uh, really excellent. Uh, thank you, Pieter and Ben, for your emails. And so this, this draft has evolved to this version 0.2. And the news is there is also an implementation in KDIC 3.3.2. There is an implementation that uh, follows this, uh, this specification both in EDNS JSON format and uh, EDNS presentation format if you use the right knob. And yeah, I would like to get feedback uh, from anyone in the NSO because it was useful so far. I would like to also hear if the actual users of those utilities are interested in it because they might be the consumers of the, of the output. And I would really like to see Dick implement at least the JSON part of the specification because I think that the EDNS record is really missing in the JSON output of Dick. And in general for this document, I, I would like to, that it and finds the right track through ITF if it if it's desired to be adopted and promoted by DNSOP, that would be the great way. If it's desired to be informational, I can submit it informationally at the like the RFC in the beginning. So I welcome any questions here or in a email. Thank you. Thank you, Nimo. Um first, Paul. So to answer your question of why it was informational and not in DNSOP, I asked if this should be in DNSOP and people said, this isn't a specification for anything that we need. Um, it's also very optional in the sense that the original RFC has two or three ways of showing lots of different stuff. It doesn't say you must do it this way because some people wanted things in the binary format. Some people wanted it expanded as text. 
I think you're going to hit the same thing here. I think it's fine for this to be informational. I don't think it needs to be in the working group as an informational document, although it could be in the working group. Um, there's no reason for it to be one way or another, but it should be informational. Um, and I don't, I've gotten very little feedback in the past on the, on my JSON format. People said, oh yeah. And then they always say, why didn't you tell me exactly which one to use? And I would say, because I would guess wrong, which is exactly what you're going to have here, especially with EDNS, because people don't even think of EDNS as much as they do the main format. Um, don't know if it's not in the working group, you can certainly go to Warren and ask to be AD sponsored. People will review it. I suspect it's just fine as is. Okay, thank you. Peter? Peter Pacheka, I see again. Uh, I will add that the original motivation for standardizing EDNS presentation format was uh, testing DNS software because we wanted to have people creating weird things in EDNS and make a format which can be reused between different implementations. That was the very original implementation um, idea. I dropped the ball. Thank you, Labor, for taking it on, and good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jim Reed, uh, uh, I'll give a shameless plug for the DNS directorate. So if you're just wanting to have a review of the document, perhaps the working group chairs here could chuck the document over to the DNS directorate, and at least you'll get a review of the document. Um, as a result of that, as to how you then negotiate it through to get it standard, I think the suggestion that's talked to before about an AD-sponsored document might be the path forward. I don't think you need to bring this to the working group. Thanks. Thank you. Greg? It's the last, uh, Greg last, Jules, last also ISC, uh, but in support. So I'm trying to convince customers to use DIG rather than NS Lookup as a full-time job. Um, and if there were a much more uh, it, if there were a much better way for them, for them to understand, get it into their heads, what it is that they're looking at, that would be good. So I'm all for this. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Libor. Thank you for your questions. Uh, next, Momoka. You may oh, use uh, whatever you like. Hello. Hello. I'm Momoka. And, oh, okay, I'm going to just take this. Um, so, OFC 3901BIS. So, um, I'm fairly new to the ITF. This is my fourth ITF. Um, and so, you might be wondering why am I writing this draft? Um, the answer is because I want a working IPv6 only resolver. And, um, I saw this RFC that had the word IPv6 and DNS, uh, DNS on it, but it was from 19 years ago. It was written in 2004. And in the last 19 years, 20 years, the adoption of IPv6 has grown and maybe it's time for an update. I'm here to ask the group if they agree or not. So um, this nice graph is made by my co-author Tobias, um, you can see um, this is how many, num the number of zones that can be resolved by an IPv6 only resolver and how many need IPv4 connectivity. For, for t so you can see for TLDs, um, you can resolve it by only IPv6 resolvers. And even for um, um, top 1 million, it's like still like 70%-ish. So it's not like all of it, but it's growing and growing year by year. So we'll get, we'll get into it. So um, what do I want to change in the text in this draft? So I have three main points that I want to change. Um, first, um, guidelines for DNS zone configuration. Currently in obviously 3901, it says every DNS zone should be served by at least one IPv4 reachable authoritative name server. So, and I think maybe it should be changed for at least one IPv4 reachable authoritative name server and at least one IPv6 reachable authoritative name server. The second thing I wanna change is um, now the recursive resolver side. Um, the current text says should for either IPv4 only or dual stack. 
But um, even though I said um, authoritative name servers should be dual stack, um, that doesn't mean all authoritative name servers will follow that. And you might need IPv4 connectivity or you might need IPv6 connectivity. So the best current practice is you should have both IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity to resolve all zones. Um, lastly, um, um, I think an addition to the text of an example of misconfiguration that can lead to IPv6 only re because of resolvers failing should be added to the text. So I think um, there's already, I, I don't know, but there's a text that speaks about how misconfigurations can happen for, resolve, resolve, for resolving to fail. But um, there's a lot of misconfigurations only for specific, specific to IPv6. And they've been kept unnoticed because IPv4 works. So if it can be resolved in IPv4, nobody has thought of changing it and fixing it. So I think an addition about how misconfigurations can happen for specific IP address. And lastly, um, I don't know much, I don't, like this isn't a strong opinion, but maybe we should ask Ayana because they do a testing for um, TLD name servers and we may add them to add a connectivity check for both IPv4 and IPv6. Um, so um, my question is, should we adopt or not adopt? And um, so I've sent an email to V6Ops yesterday and Jeff Houston, I see you on the queue, um, you gave um, nice um, concern about IPv6 and DNSSEC and long packet sizes and I see your concern. So um, also if the people, if you haven't seen that thread, um, it was at V6Ops, not this um, list. So I've sent the link to the V6Ops um, thread to this DNS Ops thread mailing list. So if you haven't seen it, you can see it on the list. So um, yeah, Jeff Houston. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, on the mic. Jeff Houston. Look, much as I don't want to sound like a heretic in the, a heretic in the church of V6, I'm a heretic. I am a non-believer. And the reason why, particularly with application into the DNS, is that one of the, one of the few things V6 changed was the treatment of packet fragmentation. Now, the DNS doesn't handle only 512 byte or smaller responses. With things like DNS in, in particular, we're dealing with much, much larger packets. And, and this has been a problem. Now, in V4, for a long time, we simply went, oh, well, let's just do forward fragmentation. I mean, it all gets too hard, and you actually set the buffer size in EDNS0. Let's just then do the truncation bit and fail over to TCP. In V6, the likelihood of that packet simply getting lost is very, very high because the combination of large packets and V6 and its fragmentation behavior and reliance on ICMP and the DNS is a remarkably poor fit. So Joao and I decided that this is not just an opinion space, we should measure. And we did mass measurements across the DNS and found that when you actually do large response behaviors over V6, the failure rate goes rocketing. Now, this has a number of impacts. It takes longer to get the answer because the poor old client that's wanting an answer either has to frob through all the other servers to actually find one where it can get an answer, typically on V4, or if it's going to do a truncation and a retry over TCP, you've actually got to do a timeout and the timers in the DNS set client software are much, much longer than the TCP round trip timer. So by saying we should do V6, you're kind of saying, I hate users. I want to make their experience crappier. I want to put more load on the DNS and I want to make it go slower. I don't think it's foolhardy to say we should do V6. I think it's completely irresponsible. 
as engineers trying to mandate a behaviour that which we have observed and measured to work poorly is not a good idea. Now, what do we do about this is kind of the next question. Maybe we all do DNS flag day. Maybe we all go and change this and do the truncation bit. That's still one round, in fact, two round trip time penalties. One to get the truncated bit and two then just bring up the TCP session. There's no good answers to this problem right now. None. And to say that we should do it when we don't have a good answer just strikes me as crazy. Thank you. Uh, Eric? Eric, Ni Eric Nigren, Akamai. Um, thanks for, thank you for doing this. I think it's long overdue that we've, we, we do this. I think there might, like, Jeff has some concerns that we should work through, but there's also a lot of authoritatives that are dual stacked at this point and a lot of recursives that are dual stacked. So I think we're better off going through and defining some of that behavior and recommending it and defining how to kind of work around some of the issues and documenting them than, um, um, than ignoring it at this point. Thank you. Um, Wes? Matt Wes Hertiker, USC, ISI, and the ICANN board. Still not speaking to the ICANN board. Um, thank you for bringing this work, and I, I'm, I'm super happy that you're new to the IETF and bringing a draft that's uh, completely awesome. Um, and I am strong support of this. I think that we do need to, uh, you know, require things that happen. There are use cases where um, Jeff's concerns are completely valid, but there are also use cases where they are not. And the right way to, to go forward is to fix the problem. And Jeff's right. There's hard problems, and we need to fix them, and we're not doing it. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be driving forward. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Rolf. Yeah. Uh, Rolf, welcome. I'm also very supportive of this. And uh, incidentally, I've also did uh, a, a presentation on work a couple of years ago where I sort of had a similar question, is the DNS v6 ready? And found where it was not v6 ready. And I'm thinking that we are getting people that are not yet v6 ready more to doing stuff so that the concerns that jeff had will get lower over time and the other thing to keep in mind is that new networks that come onto the internet often the v6 path is much faster than the v4 path because of cgnet and all the other shape banks that have to because nobody gets v4 address anymore so thank you for bringing that okay final tobias so Tobias Fibich, uh, co-author of the draft. Um, I do hear the arguments about especially MTU being an issue for the DNS. However, A, we did have our DNS flag day setting the message size to um, 13, 30, 1232, if I remember correctly. And um, I think that the MTU issues do not only affect DNS. It's basically a huge problem across all protocol families, especially with URPF running into a lot of issues. And I think even though I hear the arguments against change, um, I personally feel like the same arguments could have been made against the introduction of something new and fancy called IP um, and the discontinuation of, well, what was done on DMs before. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy, Andrew, a short question. So uh, we've been looking at the issues that post quantum algorithms will pose for DNS and DNSSEC. And uh, I'm kind of supportive of it, that Jeff does this research. And I feel that uh, this is a good example of how uh, the research should influence the standards activities. And um, I just think, uh, yeah, sometimes we can make decisions that can have a huge impact. So it's not really a question, it's a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Momoka. Uh, next, Scott. So, so to be clear, uh, follow-up discussions on the mailing list, and also the question is either DNS op or IPv6 should be the home of the document. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Benno. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Scott Hollenbeck here. Uh, 
mostly regex work here. Um, I'm here because there are some issues associated with delegation management described in this draft. Uh, titles there, you can find it in the usual place. Next slide, please. Okay. Oh, sure, yeah, thank you. So the goal of this particular draft is to mitigate some risks of domain name hijacking that have been observed in the wild based on some uh, domain registrar practices for managing what in EPP are known as host and domain objects. Uh, these objects ultimately produce delegation actions in zones. Um, and right now the uh, EPP RFCs have some text in there that basically says, if you're going to delete a host or domain object for which there are active delegations, don't just do that blindly, right? And orphan all of these delegations. Uh, there's some text that suggests that you try to clean up the delegations first. Unfortunately, because of the way um, host objects are architected and the way the DNS works, you can get situations where you've got two different domain name registrars, you know, acting as EPP clients, where one creates this host object and has administrative authority over it, but a second registrar uses that to define a delegation. Right? And so when registrar number one attempts to delete that uh, host object, for example, it can't do it because of the active delegation that registrar number two has created. So what we're trying to do in this draft is first off, describe the problem, describe what we have seen in the wild as practices for managing uh, the situation and mitigating the risk, and hopefully define some best practices based on community consensus. So I've already covered the problem a little bit. We'll skip past this. Uh, we're currently looking at version one of this draft. There was a version 00, zero that was produced around the time of IETF 117. The big delta with 01 is that we have changed the um, organization of the draft. Instead of describing what we thought were best practices, we've tried to describe the, the known practices. Uh, and describing some benefits and detriments to the existing approaches. And right now, the best practice section is basically a big TBD. We haven't made any objective observations about what we think is best. And ultimately, that's where I need some help here. So as I said, I'm at a, a point where I'm looking for help. Um, and I'm here because the issue has both delegation management and EPP delete processing aspects. Um, I realize this is probably more of a regex thing, but I, you know, I need DNS op input. And so when I say which is a better home than the other, I'm really talking about the discussion, right? And, I, and it's going to be kind of hard to have discussion on two mailing lists. Maybe that's the right thing to do. I don't know. Um, and as I said a moment ago, what we need help with is identifying what we think these best practices really are. Um, maybe from a DNS sense, if everyone is okay with the idea of simply deleting domain names, uh, you know, uh, deleting zones or deleting, you know, glue records and letting the chips fall where they may. Fine. We'll, we'll say that. I don't think that's the case, but if that's what we think our best practice is, we'll say that. Um, and as I said, if any help that can be provided, you know, from the DNS op working group, the DNS directorate, we're looking for it. It's, it's, it's some sense of consensus around what those best practices are. Um, and frankly, I don't want to hear myself talking for the next six minutes. I looked, uh, I'd like to get some discussion, some feedback from you folks. So that's my last slide. Thank you, Scott. We have Paul in the queue. And thank you for reaching out to uh, the Dean's help. Yep. Yeah. Um, I propose that you set up a new mailing list. I fully agree that there's no way to have this discussion on two mailing lists at once. I strongly believe a lot of people in this room um, don't follow regex they don't understand the tone of how s sometimes it's deep in the weeds of epp stuff and other times it's high level like this about what's the best practice i think a mailing list that is announced on both a an ietf mailing list that's announced on both it also could be long term because i think what's going to happen is it's not just for this trap it's going to be other best practices about how do we maintain things that have died? You know, no one, no one in almost any of the cultures in this room care about, you know, or want to think about dead things. DNS is very susceptible to dead things. Uh, Edward? Edward? Yeah. Edward, I, um, I was thinking about this. Um, 
from the DNS point of view, DNS protocol point of view that, that, that this room deals with. In the DNS, we're dealing with the fact that the DNS doesn't really recognize the operator. Uh, when, you, when you delegate, you're delegating the name servers, you don't know who's actually operating that. Um, in this case, it's not operator, but it's registrar. And it, the analogy here is that these are both the operators and, and registrars are the, they're kind of like the meta, the, the behind the scenes thing that are going on here. And when it gets into the DNS protocol itself, the protocol today doesn't really see either, any of them. So I don't, it's a tough road for, um, I guess, for this to relate to a DNS protocol issue, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm just kind of pointing out from the discussion um, of that. Although we do have work to bring in the DS operators into the DNS protocol, but still the provisioning side is really not necessarily, it's hard to map those. I'm familiar with both, but they don't really impact each other in a way that's pretty obvious how, you, that, how the DNS op would fix this. Um, but I understand the problem. I just want to point that out. I don't have a solution for it. Peter? Peter, do you sec? Um, so the root of the problem seems to me that uh, when things expire, um, then the databases of the registry and various registrars might get inconsistent. And I think the best thing we could do is to get as close as possible to something that's consistent instead of working around with uh, AS112 and other kinds of things. So, so my preference would be to delete things that are dead. It doesn't mean that the registrar loses the domain. They can still keep the registration. But if their name server is dead, it's dead. And there's no, no point, I think, in keeping the record around and doing weird things with it. And I understand it's, it's a multi-party problem and difficult with various registrars changing all of that. But I think getting as close as possible to that would be the best solution. Thank you. Thank you. Who's next? Oh, yeah, Warren, you're last. So, I mean, I don't really know where it lives. I thought that it was regex. And also, thank you for writing this. Like, I encourage you to write it because it's an active problem. Um, you know, maybe the idea is we have another, another mailing list. If we need that, I'm happy to sponsor it. What I would really ask is, this is an ongoing problem, and there's been a bunch of papers, like, showing that it's a problem and it's being actively exploited. Like, people register names that registry, sorry, registrars, like, delegate this to. Look, the, look up the risky business document. So I'd like us to please work on this and work on it quickly. So, you know, don't care where, don't care how, let's just get make sure it moves along so we can fix the problem and, you know, get back to real work. Yeah, thanks, Warren. And I should note that there's also an active SSAC working group looking at this. So yeah, to, to your point, Warren, one of the things I want to do is, you know, get some notion of what these best practices are and try to get the document finished as quickly as possible. Yeah, Casey Claffey and somebody, I can't remember his name, wrote a really good document on this. Um, I think the paper's called Risky Business, B-I-Z, N-E-S-S. Gauda Matawaki, who's now a co-author of the draft. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you, Scott. So, final presentation by Martina. We're running three, four, five minutes late, so please uh, stay with us. Yeah, and I try to uh, summarize two drafts I'm currently working on within two other working groups in under 10 minutes, probably. Uh, so bear with me if I talk a little bit fast and maybe skip some slides. I don't want to get into your lunch break. So I'm talking about DNS and constrained networks. Namely, there is a transfer protocol for that, DNS over co-op, and a message format for this uh, based on SIBO. And uh, our motivation is basically that we want to encrypt DNS messages for IoT devices. And the problem is that we don't talk about IoT devices such as voice assistants, switches, or even the uh, Raspberry Pi, but constraint nodes that only have a few kilobytes of RAM and ROM. Um, and we don't communicate via Wi-Fi. We communicate via constraint networks, which are characterized by low throughput, high packet loss, and asymmetric link characteristics and they have a high penalty on large packets. Uh, this can be seen in this table. I want to note uh, the right column actually for LoRaWAN where we have a frame size of oh, sometimes only 59 bytes and a very low data rate. So we want to avoid fragmentation as much as possible. Um, the possible solution for encrypting DNS are currently DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS, DNS over QUIC, and DNS over DTLS. The problem with the first two is that they run over TCP, which conflicts with our resource constraints. 
the other is DNS over quick, uh, which also uses CLS, which also conflicts with our resource constraints. And DNS over DTLS has a problem that we have no segmentation in it. So we, we, we can't uh, uh, get it small enough for our constraint link layer PDUs. So our proposal is to use DNS over co-op, where we have encrypted communication using either DTLS or Bosco, which is us, uh, object security. So think of BGP over the, uh, <laughs> over, uh, no, not BGP, PGP, <laughs> sorry, uh, over, over the wire. And uh, blockwise message transfer, which basically provides us with message segmentation and also, and, and also recovery. And we also are able to share system resources with if we have already a core application present. So this basically explains why we use the fetch method in co-op. I just skip this quickly. Um, if you want to know, uh, just read the draft. Um, and this basically is an evaluation of how the memory consumption of each implementation that uses UDP as a transport works. And we see um, if a co-op application is already present uh, on the right side that at least for ROM, we have a clear advantage when using OSCOR um, over the other encrypted protocols. Um, yeah, that summarizes it as, as well. Um, exactly. And when we now look at name sizes, um, we see that there are similarities with the uh, uh, typical IXP uh, names in the IoT. Um, this is based on a consumer base, uh, consumer device uh, uh, data set. Um, but we have longer names uh, in the IoT actually, and this is because we have uh, these devices typically communicate with cloud services and CDNs, which use names such as this. Um, and if we just look at the smallest one, and yes, we introduce some new headers, but these are, are not the smallest headers that we can see, but typical ones, let's say that. Um, even for this uh, small name, the DNS name is, or, uh, the DNS message is already too long, exactly one byte. So we get fragmentation in link layers such as 802.15.4. So remember, high penalty on link layer fragmentation. So we also need some kind of concise DNS message format to get this done. Um, and this is why we introduced the application DNS plus SIBO media type and content format, which means you can use it with both stock. And if you are in some crappy open I, uh, hotel uh, Wi-Fi, you can also use it with DOH if you want to. Um, and if you want to have more information how that would work, uh, you can read our draft. So just to give a a small overview on what happened in the other working groups. The DNS over co-op uh, draft was first presented at ITF 113 in Vienna. Um, the work there is mostly done. We are just waiting for some more implementation. There's some uh, on, uh, ongoing discussion still about bootstrapping doc with S service B records. Um, the problem there is that for the ALPN ID, there is nothing defined for co-op over DTLS yet. And for ad hoc, there's completely, it's completely unspecified. However, there is large interest in service B records in, uh, in, in the code working group in general, because, uh, for example, we want to also uh, reduce the num growing number of these URIs that are in the format of core plus dot, dot, dot. Uh, so we are planning to publish a problem statement on that that then will be referenced on by the doc draft. And regarding CBOR, um, this was first presented in uh, London uh, in, at ITF 115. Um, so uh, there, the, uh, the discussion currently is about name compression. It's not the problem that we can't compress names. It's more that we have with CBOR pack multiple methods to compress it, and we're just deciding on how. And then the last question that we had is, uh, if we want to allow for more than one question in the message format, currently we don't. But as we saw in one slide already before, there is now some uh, necessity for that. So. So, um, in conclusion, DNS over co-op is needed because uh, our uh, the uh, UDP uh, conflicts with our privacy constraints. Uh, the other formats conflict with our resource constraints. Um, it is on par with existing uh, UDP-based uh, transfer protocols, uh, and but has an advantage in packet size and memory consumption compared to other uh, encrypted transfer protocols. 
And we also introduced the CBO based message format to avoid expensive fragmentation. And also there are two reference implementations of each. So the, both the uh, transfer protocol and the message format in Python and for the embedded operating system, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Edward has a question. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you also for the, well, high speed presentation. Uh, excellent, thanks. Uh, Edward. Ed Lewis, Ed Lewis again. Um, so I read this quickly and I'm trying to remember the draft, but it, I, something struck in me in it uh, was that you assumed that in the responses, all the domain name owners would be, it would be like one owner for, for all the records. And I thought right away, well, DNSSEC blows that away. So that kind of opened up a whole question in my mind is, are, is this, in, are these devices thought to be doing their own DNS resolution where they're going to hunt through the root server down to the answer? Or are they going to lean on a recursive server that's kind of dedicated to co-op as a transfer? It's, that's my first question. It's more uh, leaning on the doc server to uh, so the DNS of a co-op server to uh, do some processing of the messages beforehand. And regarding, for example, DNSSEC, we're not sure if this makes sense to sense this over such a constraint domain. And if we have OSCO or D DTLS, we basically also already have the authenticity of the messages somewhat. Uh, 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 confirmed. So, yeah. yeah so, so if you if you're going to a trusted recursive server working on your behalf, yeah, um, then the security becomes more of a channel security than data security, uh, to some sense. I mean, on one hand, when you see now the data is transferring hands, basically, I'm taking out of one train that came to the station and reporting it to something else. Uh, you might the, the end device may still want to validate that that was from the source. That's where DNS actually becomes you know maybe a positive to the end thing unless you really trust that device on your behalf. The other, the other reason why, I, I know this could be a bigger discussion, but the other part of this was um, the Delic record talk is going on there. The Delic record might be really huge and its intent is to help you get from this kind of DNS to that kind of DNS. And it's necessary to do that, but that would go the wrong direction for this, unless it's saying, we're gonna go to the DNS to help the co-op devices, but you're gonna take, you're gonna then report all the data back into co-op like a multi-step process. So this is where I, I think this, this case should be looked at by the Deleg folks to say, we want to make sure we accommodate this and also understand we accommodate what's needed here. Like, this is like basically like a, a, a stub resolver relationship, not a necessarily resolver to authoritative relationship, I believe. So, yeah. Thank you. Next, uh, Ben, remote. Hi. Uh, so thanks, thanks for bringing this to DNS up. Uh, I, I think it's really great to get the review here. I, uh, I think that the DNS over co-op side is looking good. Um, and I'm definitely more concerned about the DNS CBOR side. Uh, you know, this is a lot like defining a JSON representation for DNS. Uh, in fact, I think it actually may define a D uh, implicitly a JSON representation for DNS and uh, as you may have just heard, uh, the last time somebody tried that, it uh, couldn't couldn't get through DNS op and ultimately uh, went through independent stream. Uh, so, I think it's uh, it's an interesting challenge. I think it's going to be really helpful to be very precise about the targeted use case and, and you know and the level of generality. Thank you for your <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for the feedback, Ben. Uh, sorry, Carson, we closed the queue. We are running three minutes late. Thank you, Martina. Um, maybe if you haven't done so, post some links to the mailing list for DNS so, yeah. for, uh, for review. And maybe we can also ask the DNS dear directorate for and, reviews and of the document. I already communicated with Excellent. them about that, but yeah, I can yeah. again poke them. So Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this concludes the DNSOP working group session two on Friday. Um, see you probably during an interim and also hopefully uh, for the next ITF 119 in Brisbane. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.